since uh, apparently a bunch of you can hear me, um, I would like to welcome you all to Highway 21, to Interstate 680, the history of the road that connects us. My name is Dan Dunham, the director of the Museum of the Ceremon Valley. Um, the history of this event is that we would normally be doing a um, brunch at Diablo Country Club. And as you all know, uh, the world has changed and um, we can't do that anymore, <laughs> at least not for a while. So uh, welcome to this virtual brunch. I uh, hope everybody has some lunch that they can um, have while they're, while they're listening to us. Um, at the last few brunches, we had a number of people that came up and said, I don't know anything about Highway 21 and how 680 got there. So uh, we, we do listen to you. And uh, we went to the expert. Um, our speaker today has written the book on Highway 21 and literally written the book on Highway 21. Uh, it's for sale in our museum shop and um, I would advise you to, to go home and grab it. Uh, Steve Minier is our, our speaker today. He is an excellent historian. I've known Steve for a number of years. Uh, and I think you will find his presentation interesting. And uh, the photographs, when you get to them, are, are terrific. And for those of you who have been talking about not being from here and not knowing what this area looked like, I think Steve's going to uh, solve that for you. Um, feel free to use the question and answer uh, button at the bottom of your screen. I'll kind of be monitoring that. and. Uh, uh, we'll have a question and answer period at the end, or, or um, if I happen to know the answer to that, I can give it a shot. And speaking of giving it a shot, at the end of this, um, please go to the museum website, museumsrv.org. You will find a Donate Now button there, and if you like this presentation and would like to see more of these things, please utilize that button. I would also say if you really like this and you think these things are interesting, consider becoming a member of the museum. You can do that online too. Uh, on July the 18th, we are having our online auction gala. Our auction baskets will start appearing before the 18th and they will continue for a few days after the 18th. That's accessible on our website. And we'll be doing some more of these videos. Uh, we already have a few in mind and uh, well, I'm looking forward to doing more. So without any further uh, hesitation on my part, I would like to introduce our speaker today on Highway 21 and 680, Steve Minier. Steve? Well, hello everybody. Um, just to be totally honest, this is new to me. I'm used to talking to people that I can see Instead, I'll be staring at this little eye on top of my computer, and hopefully that will give you some idea that, yes, I do interact with people sometimes. So um, I want to thank you for taking the time to listen to me. I am not the expert on Highway 21. I think there are a couple of different experts. Um, the, one of the things about local history is the more you think you know, the less you actually do know. Um, so I'll try and give you an overview of uh, what Highway 21 is, a little bit about how it's uh, related to Alameda County and Contra Costa County, but I'm primarily going to try and orient this to all of you who live in Contra Costa County. And um, just because some of you told us in the early part as we waited that you are not originally from California, I may throw in a little bit of, of early uh, California history and uh, let's just see how we go with time. And I'll turn my timer on so I have a sense. Okay, off we go. Well, we would go off, we would go if we could get this to go. There we go, press harder. So one of the things I wanna start with is to uh, acknowledge all those people who helped me understand what Highway 21 is. And um, I want to suggest to all of you that if you do Facebook, one of the really fun things to take a look at local history is a Facebook page called 680 slash 24 corridor history. And many of the photos that you will see today 
come from that Facebook page, and actually many of them come from the Contra Costa Historical Society and the Museum of the San Ramon Valley. But uh, Mark Harrigan, who I give uh, a shout out to as an honorary historian, and nostalgistician, will let you think, if you've grown up in Contra Costa County, he will remind you of those interesting good old days. Um, I also want to thank the uh, John Mercurio, who wrote a pamphlet with me two years ago, which was the genesis of actually doing a little bit of history on something that is often forgotten, which is the roads uh, around the towns that we live in. And of course, I couldn't talk about Contra Costa history if I didn't mention Beverly Lane and thank Beverly for all that she's done to give us information, uh, including some of these photos. But um, I'm also definitely afraid of the questions that she's going to ask in the course of this or calling me out on any mistakes. Naturally, any mistakes that I make are mine alone, and um, you, can, you can blame me. If you want to, just feel free to scream at your uh, monitor. That's the nice thing about being at home. Uh, you can override me anytime you want. If you throw any fruit at me, just realize that you have to clean up the mess because you're throwing the fruit at your own computer. So to set the stage, uh, what is Highway 21? For many of us, um, Highway 21 does not exist. It is just a historical artifact. But you all know it in a different way. You know it as San Ramon Valley Boulevard, Hearts Avenue, Danville Boulevard, it's South Main Street in Walnut Creek, Contra Costa Boulevard, Pacheco Boulevard. It's that two lane or more road that is just off of 680 that is the way that we get to one place or another when in fact the freeway is all clogged up. In the day, back as far as a long time ago, that was the only way to get north and south in this area. In fact, it was the only way to get from Martinez all the way down to Mission San Jose and San Jose. Um, so it's had various names. It's uh, been in various shades of repair. But when we think about that, kind of surface street that we often use that really gives the sense to our communities. We're talking about Highway 21 as far as I'm concerned, but you may call it the boulevards or Contra Costa Highway, but it's that connecting piece that makes us all together. So here's a map. We're going to start way back in time. We're going to go chronologically. So this is a map you've probably never seen before. And if you've ever wondered what the communities around here in the Bay Area were like, a thousand, two thousand, three thousand years ago. This is kind of what you might have seen. These are uh, an estimation of the various Native American groups or languages that were spoken. So they were all here for thousands and thousands of years before us. And in fact, that road that we think about, either 680 or Highway 21 or the boulevards, they were the first ones to make those paths up and down San Ramon Valley and Amador Valley as they tried to connect with their communities. So when you see the little gray dot just to the right of San Francisco Bay, that's basically where Dublin is nowadays. Um, but there were two tribes, the Sunun and the Pelman. And if you go north, you will see a linkage, which is basically Highway 21 uh, later on. But these were also Native American paths that uh, they used to trade fish or acorns or flints for arrows. They did have a lot of interaction. And when the Spanish and Mexican later came along, they utilized the trail that you see right there from basically Mission San Jose all the way up to Martinez as the outliers of the missions and also the way to get to the past, uh, pastoral areas where they herded all their sheep and cattle. That all starts to change around the gold rush in 1850. This is um, an early map of the connection between Mission San Jose and the north. And that's the mail route. This is the way that the horse would carry your mail or maybe a wagon or maybe a stagecoach later on. But this is the road through some communities that have different names now than they did back then. But this is basically using the Native American trails to connect the early communities of the San Ramon and Amador Valley. And also these 
secondary trails that branched off from this main one were one of the ways that you got up to the gold country. So for those of you who don't know a little bit about California history, California history basically starts in 1850 when we become a state. Contra Costa County was one of the first counties and it was a huge county. It was basically all of what you know as Contra Costa County now and a good portion, the northern portion of Alameda County. And then there was just Santa Clara. In 1853, that changed with the breaking off of the southern part to become Alameda County. So what would you see on the road back then? Well, you would see carriages, you would see horses, you would see a lot of agricultural products, generally hay in the early, uh, late 1800s and early 1900s, a lot of dirt roads, it was muddy in the winter and it was dusty in the summer. Um, and it was often very, very crowded with the people as they went from back and forth because this road, you know, what you call the boulevards now, that was the only way to get north and south. And this was the only way to get there via your various forms of horse-drawn locomotion. While this not, is not exactly um, a long trail that we're calling out the Highway 21, this is really, by the early 1900s, the way things looked. And most roads in California back then are still dirt, and they would have been supported by the local people nearby. Every able-bodied male in Contra Costa County originally owed about five days of labor to keep the roads up. That is, unless they could find someone else to do it, uh, and then you hired that person to take care of it. But that was your cut. You were Caltrans. And just to let you know that things haven't really changed, roads have accidents. And probably the only um, item of note about San Ramon, Danville, Alamo, Dublin, was when there was an accident. And this was an example of an accident. So you can have accidents in stagecoaches too. And there are famous ones in Dublin history. And this is a good example. I think this one was actually on Crow Canyon. But, you know, the roads were dangerous. Horses could be uncontrolled. And, you know, one of the problems with safety back then, if you had an accident in a stagecoach, pretty much everybody got hurt. Right after stagecoaches and horses and wagons, Many of us forget about that the early best transportation that came out in the early 1900s was the bicycle. They were cheap, they were easy to use, and they kind of worked pretty well on dirt roads. And this is the kind of dirt road that you would ride your bicycle on if you didn't have a horse. One of the other fun things about living out here in the hinterlands, uh, Oakland and San Francisco considered us the back of beyond, and of no interest. Around 1914, people started to find out that if they were gonna have a car, they needed some place to go. And San Francisco wasn't the only place to drive. So they discovered the great outback, so to speak, and that was us. And this is an early uh, example of how you can take your car or your bicycle to go for a nice long ride. One of the fun things is, obviously the people in Oakland and San Francisco didn't know how to spell because they got Dublin wrong and they got many other things out here wrong. Um, I'm still not sure about how you get from Etamot to Altamont, but this was in the San Francisco newspaper about a fun place to take a drive in the day. And this is what you would see when you were on the road. You would see three or four cars, probably at least one or two broken down by the side of the road as you fixed your tire, waited for your water to cool, um, and this is actually a picture of the road from Dublin into Hayward, uh, the Dublin Canyon Road that we know of today. And so why were people out here? Why did they need roads? Well, out here at the time, after you got through raising cattle and sheep, you didn't tra transition to other crops. But it, it was the time of orchards, and orchards here were very, very famous and very, very productive. There were really no railroads to take the produce into market until about 1900. Uh, about 1908, you've got the connection that goes all the way through the San Ramon Valley. But a little bit before that, you had the railroads that started. But most of the produce, the Bishop, California Bartlett's, all the other fruit, 
came by wagon or truck eventually to Martinez or to a railhead, either in Pleasanton or Livermore, to go in. But roads still brought a lot of things together, and these are the things that were connected along what we found later on to be Highway 21. And I love many of these pictures and I love the graphics. Uh, they're just lots of fun. But I still kind of wonder in my own mind where the Mount Diablo fruit farm was. We have to remember also that back then, even as late as 1920, there aren't a lot of people out here. Um, in 1860, uh, 10 years after the beginning of Contra Costa County, there were only 2,200 people in the entire county. And that doesn't grow very much. Even by 1900, there's only about 7,000 people in the entire county of Contra Costa. And the vast majority of those people are in Richmond They're not and Martinez. And they're not out here along the country road where the Bell Store and Post Office were in Alamo. We're only talking about a couple hundred people. And I think that's one of those differences between now and then that we often forget about. So the road is important, but how many people travel on a road really depends on where the road will take you. As long as Martinez was kind of the end point, you had to stop there and either take a ferry across. But later, by the 1930s, as the country starts to get integrated a little bit better, and there's a little bit more money thrown at transportation by the state of California and the federal government, they start to make some more of these connections, like the railroad bridge that goes across at Carquinez. It's interesting to note that when we think about how we get around nowadays, we, did, we don't realize that the first car bridge across the Carquinez Straits isn't until 1960 or so. So most of the travel is just up and down the valley and people going in and out to Oakland and some other places. Also, when you look at these old photos, um, take a look and see at the background of just how few trees and how few vegetation there is. And that's another difference about then and now. So around 1933, the roads that used to connect us down through the San Ramon Valley were pretty much supported just by the county. In 1933, the state of California decided that they were going to start to integrate and actually give real highway names to places. Before 1930, if you wanted to go to San Ramon, you took the San Ramon Road. Or if you wanted to go to Dublin, you took the Dublin Road. And sometimes they were well maintained and sometimes not. In 1933, the highway system in the state of California gets put together and they begin to rationalize the numbers. So it's really around that time that Highway 21, the highway, which is also at that time called the Contra Costa Highway, is put together. And in this map, please note that maps can lie, the connection between Walnut Creek and Martinez is actually direct. There actually are roads there. But this map was just telling you about the brand new Highway 21 that was going to take you and whisk you on a two-lane paved road. And all the way up to the 1960s, the two-lane road is the one that connects everybody, and that's it. Imagine the traffic. And on these little roads in the backcountry, you had to have these little stores. So while we get nostalgic about some of the old gas stations, we need to realize that cars back then often broke down, and you really needed these gas stations. And gas stations back then weren't just a place to stop and get your Diet Coke or your Coca-Cola or your Mountain Dew and then get back on the road. These were central hubs of the community where you got together and met and spent time. All of this nice Highway 21 that's put together in the 1930s to knit these farming communities together begin to change by 1940. And what happens in World War II is that the federal government starts discovering that there's these broad open places beyond San Francisco Bay where they can put in many of these bases. So suddenly you see Camp Stoneman show up, you actually get a Camp Alamo, a Camp Berkeley, and you get in Dublin, you get 90,000 people living out in Camp Parks, Camp Shoemaker, and Shoemaker Naval Hospital. And if you look at this map on the left, you will see the Contra Costa Highway. That's Route 21. 
The reason that they build these bases out here, including Livermore Naval Air Station, is because the land is cheap and there is a good connection. These roads will allow people to go from base to base and support the buildup of the military as they get ready to fight the war in the Pacific. This radically changes all of these communities about where we live now. And one of the things that becomes important is that if the Navy can build bases out here and have 90,000 people live out here, maybe somebody else can live out here after the war. The other part is that Dublin, San Ramon, Alamo, Danville all become much more centralized in everybody's view about how to connect the whole country and how to connect California. And you can see this in this map from Shoemaker Naval Hospital, where they show people why this is centrally located and how important, for example, Highway 21 is to get back and forth. Now, if you think that Highway 21 during World War II is all about, you know, agriculture, you're kind of right, but it's really more about moving people and equipment to the various bases that are out here between Pittsburgh and Martinez and down to San Jose. One of the highlights of my research just for this presentation is realizing that even by 1940, Highway 21 was crucial to national security because they would take the road and use it for the transportation of munitions. I guess they felt it was safer to have things blow up in Danville and Alamo than it was if they had taken them through Oakland and Berkeley. Be that as it may, it brings this whole area a whole new prominence that goes on and becomes much import more important later on. And this is what you would have seen in 1940, 42, 44, 46. Buses and buses moving troops and sailors back and forth. In fact, we've had some people give little oral histories that talk about being in Alamo or Danville and not being able to get out of their farm because the roads are blocked off by military police as convoy after convoy goes by, but sometimes for almost over an hour. It was a rapid and tremendous change to this little area. So what did it look like back in the day? This is, we think, your downtown view of Highway 21 may be going through Walnut Creek, we're not exactly sure. But by 1945, at the end of the war especially, you started to have a little bit more money to upgrade the roads that you had worn out during, during the war. It's not just at the end of World War II that you know, people realize that there's a out here to come and visit and stay in. Even during the Cold War, Highway 21 which is shown on this match cover is important as a connector between Parks Air Force Base and the rest of the country and the rest of the Bay Area. This map here from about 1953 shows you, and this is a, a AAA um, auto map, that the only way to get from Dublin to Walnut Creek is on this one major road, which is two lanes. And as this area back here begins to be developed, the traffic becomes increasingly horrible as you try and get from one place to another. Because by 1960, whereas in 1940, there were 100,000 people in all of Contra Costa County, by 1960, it had quadrupled. There were over 409,000 people living, and many of them were moving to this area here. So not only is it a good place to put an Air Force base, it's Parks Air Force Base, which is funny, it's Air Force Base that never had a runway, be that as it may. But all these people have a place and they can start to develop. And this is the traffic that you start to see uh, on, in Walnut Creek, for example. And remember, all the traffic's going through downtown, all the traffic's going through Alamo, and which is great if you've got a business there, but it's not really great if you want to try and travel very far. So what was like? So I talk about it being crowded. Well, it's not all that crowded sometimes. This is Highway 21 in Danville. So this is your typical view. I tend to think that one of the problems with photos that we get from back in the day is that no one takes a picture when, the, when there's a lot of cars in the street. They all wait until all the cars stop 
and then they take a picture. Nonetheless, take a look at this gas station back in the day, the cars from back in the day. See the Bank of America across the street and this station? Look in this next picture and see if you can find them. So the roads are important not just to move from one place to another. It's a social place. It's a place where you celebrate your parades. And these 4th of July parades start in 1962 in Danville. And over here on the right is that standard oil station. And over here is the Bank of America. But these, by 1962, these are the many people that are starting to live in the area and they're starting to be involved in the communities. So where you only had one or 200 people, mainly farmers, you get a whole set of new businesses to take care of all the new people that are coming. But you still have kind of small growth, small buildings, kind of sleepy little towns sometimes, or not. I think when you ever want to get an idea of what it used to be like out here, drive between Danville and Alamo. The road is still two lanes sometimes, and while these elm trees have all died, there are still a sense of how quiet it could be if you just multiply that, not by that three or four mile stretch, but make it, you know, 30 or 40 miles. And here's what you would have looked like on Highway 21 coming to Dublin. No exits, no interstate, just a small sign. And as late as 1960, early 59, 60, sometimes even later, this is what it would have looked like. And the sign in Dublin says 200 people. I'll get back to this, but I'll, I'll talk about it now. Remember back in the day, um, they didn't have highway signs. Um, and sometimes the only way to know whether or not you went from one county to another was to look in the corner and see if one of these plinths were stuck in the side of the road. This actually was put into place by Alameda County and Contra Costa in 1895. And it was the only way you knew you crossed the border. And the border basically is at Alcosta and San Ramon Road. We'll see that later. Everything starts to change around 60. By 1964, there are huge developments. And in any particular Sunday, if you looked at the insert, the real estate insert in your newspaper, this is what you would see. If you were in Oakland or San Francisco and you wanted that new house for your new community or your new family, this is where you started looking. And you would start to come out here and see all these brand new houses and you would take Highway 21 to connect you from Highway 50 or Highway 24. But as you can see in this picture here on the right, which is a picture of uh, Dublin, this is actually Alcosta or will become Alcosta. This is Highway 21. They were planning for the freeway. There was a realization as early as the 50s that there needed to be a way to connect the country throughout the country, not just in California, but they started to spend money and this will be 680. And 680 and the, co and, and the buildings change everything. This is the same picture from the street level, Alcosta Road. And down here, you can just see that they're doing the construction and this uh, lovely old car. We also start to get to the point where all our communities are no longer is it a stop sign community. Some of us get our very first traffic signal and we make a big deal out of it. I'm hoping someday that in San Ramon or Alamo, they will find a picture of the first traffic signal in those towns. So far, this is all we've got from Dublin. That is that little mark that I showed you earlier. And this is the side that says, oh, by the way, when you go south on San Ramon Road, you're entering Contra Costa County. So what did the freeway look like? What did the freeway change? Well, it finally put the last death knells into an agricultural community. As you can see here, all these orchards are being replaced and are overwritten by the introduction of the freeway. And soon following all this will be yet another reason, an economic reason, to build even more houses and therefore even more buildings. If you uh, want to get an idea of where we are here, Imagine that you're at the Crow Canyon overpass and you're looking north. And if you ever heard of the brass door, 
the brass door is right over here. And this is Highway 21. This is what is getting replaced by this. And 680, which takes over the role of Highway 21, is phased into our area pretty much from 1960 all the way through 68. Each, there were sections that were added slowly from time to time. Um, one of the fun things about talking to people who lived here in the early 60s, um, they were all kids, I mean, we get kids stories, but of how they loved sneaking down onto the freeway and having dad give them their first driving lesson um, out here or mom giving them their first lesson or riding across the freeway to go to school. I love that. So to some extent, that brings us up to Highway six, uh, Interstate 680 and where we are today. And um, without 680, we probably wouldn't all be here um, because it makes it reasonable to live here and commute. Um, it allows lots of businesses and people to come out here. So this is pretty much the standard of who we are nowadays. This, believe it or not, down here is an image of Highway 21, of the remainders of Highway 21. And this is 680 um, and on any particular day. Now, the fun thing about this picture is I could probably ask all of you to sit, tell me where you think this is. And pretty much all of you would get it wrong, but you'd also get it right. Because pretty much anywhere from Dublin to Martinez, you could sit on the hills on the south side of 680 and take this view. And you would see trees and houses and the building, a busy 680 and a few cars on Highway 20, what used to be Highway 21. So I think that is pretty much it. Oh, and by the way, if you ever want to see a piece of Highway 21, as if anybody would, but anyway, there's still a little piece of the actual roadway down near um, Sunol and just off the side of what is Foothill Road down there because Highway 21 actually all the way went to, Santa, to Mission San Jose and down on the Alameda County site, it was called Foothill. But yes, someone was so interested in Highway 21 that he went out and actually found a little piece of it. So uh, just a reminder, those are fun people and thank you for their work in collecting our history so people can make you know, boring presentations on Highway 21. And I thank God I can't hear the people snoring. But if you have any questions, now is the time to ask. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. And um, we do have some questions, but before we could do that, uh, certainly this wasn't boring to me. And I don't, uh, we've had other people that have been chatting about what a great pro program this is. So um, Alan had asked, was there a way across the Carquinez Strait before the freeway? Yes. So you would go to Martinez and you would take the ferry across. And there were actually a couple of ferries um, before they built the Richmond's, the, um, the other bridge. Um, so there were ferries, like five or six ferries that would cross. So you could get the Rio Visto from one ferry. You could get go to Martinez and take the ferry across. And then later on, there was the railroad bridge. But there was still a ferry all the way up to, to 1962, I think it was, uh, when the first bridge was built. OK. And I've got a, something in the chat that I think you might be interested in, and I think I'm going to read it to you. It said, this is from John, uh, and it said, Mount Diablo Fruit Farm was my family's farm in Ignacio oh. Valley. Uh, property bought about 1885 by Hubert Hal Bancroft. Oh. And it was a day's journey from San Francisco, and in quotes, a gentleman had a farm in the country. <laughs> If it is the Bancroft that I'm thinking of, Bancroft is considered to be the, the early foremost historian for the state of California. Um, yeah, a a yeah. sideline for that box, there's a picture behind that box, and I think it came across from, the, from Mark Harrigan's Facebook page, but he had been talking about that particular fruit farm, and one of the random people sent him that photo saying, I found this box and I think they found it at an antique store in Connecticut. <laughs> so the fruit traveled far and wide. Well, that's good. <laughs> um, 
Question from Garrett. Was the 21 bus named in high honor of Highway 21? I'm not sure. You're going to have to give me a little bit more about what the 21 bus was. Okay, Garrett, here's your shot. <laughs> uh, let's see. Did Highway 21 follow what is now Dublin Canyon Road or Niles Canyon Road? That's from Steve. So um, the Highway 21 basically starts in Martinez, goes all the way down kind of the western portion of the San Ramon and Amador Valleys. When it gets to Dublin, it's, it just goes straight south. And there's a little bit of confusion. Um, Highway 21 had different parts at different times. So when it got down to Sinol, there appears to be for a little while, it then went west along Niles Canyon to connect with Mission Boulevard. But there may have very well been a dirt road that went from um, Sinol south. And that farm road then got paved and then that actually wound up being a, a better connector Rather than having to go through Niles, you could actually go south and go over the hills to Mission San Jose. Okay. And then Alan asked if the numbers 2 and 1, 21, have a significance. No. Okay. Uh, um, it, it's just a matter of the way the state of California chose to put together its highway system. I think even the state did something like... It, the interstate system, there's an odd and even thing. One is north-south, one is east-west. I can't remember. I think odds are north-south. I think the state did that a little bit, but I'm not sure. Okay, and Chuck chimed in with some potential criminal activity that they had used 680 to do uh, as a drag strip uh, before it opened, but I think the statute of limitations is probably passed on that. So crime is a, an aspect of roads. <laughs> quite often, we don't talk in history about the crimes. Although, when you think about it and look at the newspapers back in the day, they were filled with who got murdered or, or who got horribly mangled in a farm accident. Um, Highway 21 has a very important part of overall history um, back during the Prohibition because it was a great way to move alcohol um, from one part of the state to the other part of the state without going through Oakland and Berkeley. Okay. Um, from Warren, do you know who owned the small grocery store in that last picture of yours at the corner of Lavorna and Danville Boulevard? I live just down the street from that store. Um, Unfortunately, I can't get access to my photos while I'm doing the presentation. Okay. Um, but um, Beverly Lane does. Okay. So um, ask Beverly and or leave a note there at the museum, and I'm sure she'll tell you um, all about it because she did call it something. I don't know what it is. And whatever she called it when she gave me the caption to this last picture, she didn't call it the Mount Diablo grocery. It's like owls or something. So, so talk to that. Okay, Warren, shoot us a, shoot us a, an email and we'll take care of that for you. Um, Joyce, uh, the map shows 21 going to Martinez, but before that it was ending between Bay Point and Pittsburgh. Um, I think she's right. And I think, once again, that map is a construct of a particular date and time. Um, so uh, I think there was a period right after, I think that's 1933. I think there's a period when the, the road, Highway 21, formally gets rerouted back to a straight connection from Walnut Creek to Martinez. So there are roads that connect there but which one is state sanctioned and identified as the official Highway 21 changes over time. Okay. Um, another one from Andrew here. Did the key system, today's Iron Horse Trail, play any part of, trans of the transportation system with Highway 21? So the short answer is no, but you can never get a short answer from Steve. So um, the key system, how do, how do I put this? 
So the train system, the, the path that we walk on, and I love the Iron Horse Trail, that connection from basically Walnut Creek South is originally a, a railroad connection for the Southern Pacific that all the various farming communities get together and donate their land and give it to Southern Pacific if Southern Pacific will please put a railroad to move the farm produce. So at the very beginning, and this is the late 1800s, the, all the farmers donate their land. Southern Pacific eventually puts a rail system in there, it goes to San Ramon. And there are, for a little while, there are passenger uh, trains on it, but primarily it was freight then. And then in the uh, very early 1900s, the last piece from San Ramon to Pleasanton uh, that goes through Dublin, um, uh, C.W. Doherty was the main landowner. He was a little bit smarter. He got Southern Pacific to pay for it, but there never really was uh, passenger service. But that doesn't mean that the key system, which really kind of went, I think, to Walnut Creek and then had connections up to Lafayette, there was a trolley system more kind of on a train track so the key system never really made it out here, but you gotta remember, you know, even back in 1900, when a lot of this was getting built, there's only 7,000 people in the entire county, and which means there's only a couple of hundred people out here. So there's not enough to make a passenger system really profitable. Okay. Um, Steve, I think that's it. Uh, okay. And uh, before we all go, I'd like to thank you all for listening and watching today's program. The Museum of the San Ramon Valley does, knows how to do a lot of things. This was not one of them. <laughs> so I'd like to thank Steve for his patience in going through several days of, uh, of practice sessions. And our two partners here, John Keenan and Donna Greer, uh, were both long suffering uh, uh, and worried about this for a long, long time. Yeah, thumbs up to those two as well. So uh, I'd like to thank them. And once again, and for our purposes, um, if you like this, uh, please visit our website, museumsrv.org. Hit the Donate Now button, and it'll actually take you to a screen where you can mention the brunch, and that's why uh, your donation is being made. Uh, consider being a member. Uh, I'd like to uh, the beginning of this when people were chiming in from with where they were from and where they live now and what they knew and what they didn't know. Uh, consider our gala auction on the 18th. It's an online auction a few days before on our website and a few days after the 18th of July. And I think we're going to be doing some more of these videos. And so um, please check back with our website for that one too. And I would again like to thank you for listening and watching today. Um, hope you have a good day. Stay safe out there.